crossovers can give us some really weird matchups. For every Alien vs Predator, there's a Spider-Man vs Ren and Stimpy. <laughs> or a Batman Scooby-Doo team up, or a Green Lantern Colonel Sanders deathmatch, or whatever that was. And guess what? Transformers, being Hasbro's biggest property, has got quite a few of these as well. Hi, and welcome back to the inside of my head. In this video, we look at the time that Fortress Maximus became the Starship Enterprise, the time a DeLorean became an Autobot, the time that Starscream's ghost jumped into an angel's body from Evangelion, the time Bumblebee yeeted a T-800, yeet, and the time that Cup got the true death at the hands of the Darkling Lord, and got turned into a zombie, and got banished to the dead universe. We see what a Terminator Transformer hybrid would look like, and we see if Optimus could beat Cthulhu. Of course he can, he's Optimus. This is Sparta! And so much more. So please take a second to like, share, and subscribe, and all that good stuff, because ultimately it does help me make more videos like this. Do as I command! Okay, okay, jeez. Now, there are tons of smaller references and nods to the Transformers everywhere. Oh! Transformers! I've been looking for Razor Beast since like October! Natalie Portman loved G1 in Leon the Professional. There's a famous reference in The Simpsons. A number of them actually. Blaster was in Chippendale. And apparently one of my favorite video games, Titanfall, when you eject, there's a chance that your machine bids you farewell by saying, till all are one. And the toys, well, they deserve their own vid. Now I can't get into every single nod, cameo, or reference, but let's start with the time that Mars Attacks met the Transformers. Now this one is odd to me because considering the comic came out in 2013, it seemed to be dredging up a franchise that's 27 years old. Technically, even going back to 1962 when it started out as a trading card series. The comics have been going strong though, and this crossover was one of five one-shot specials, where the Martians attacked Popeye, Kiss, yeah, they've got their own comic, the Ghostbusters, and Zombies vs. Robots. And if you thought the little green men wouldn't really be all that much of a threat to our favorite transforming mobile weapons platforms, well, just ask Ironhide who had his arm blown off in the opening pages. The story is about how Megatron, in one last act of desperation after having his ass kicked by the Autobots, allies himself with the invaders, until they inexplicably double-cross him and put them all in an energy bubble. And Megatron has to align himself with the Autobots to fight them back and save Earth. At one point, they shrink Megatron down to the size of a doll, but he still blows one's brains out with his fusion cannon. Starscream takes his opportunity to try and smush him like a bug, but surprise, surprise, fails, and Megatron comes close to clawing his face off. The Transformers fight the Martians, old school bots, the Insecticons come up against their giant ants, and Cosmos's UFO mode comes in really handy, as he's able to get right close up to the flying saucers and blast them. And blast them good. Because they exist. It ends as abruptly as it began, with the Martians defeated and the warring Cybertronian factions going back to being warring Cybertronian factions, and like all things Mars Attacks, it's super tongue-in-cheek, tapping into its own brand of B-movie parody. It's short, it's sweet, and like a lot of these on this list, it's more of just a novelty than anything else. Speaking of crossovers no one really asked for, let's look at Visionaries. Back in 1987, Hasbro released an animated series called Visionaries Knights of the Magical Light. It's about this planet called Prismos, which is like this technological utopia, and everything's fine and dandy until these here planets align and, and it sends out some kind of EMP and it knocks out all of the technology. The planet has to return to the ways of magic to survive, and the show centers around the Visionaries, the good spectral knights, and the evil Darkling Lords. Basically, all these guys get animal powers based on their personal attributes. It was just an excuse to sell action figures with holograms on their chests. The the cartoon was cancelled after just one season, and the Marvel comics only lasted six issues. But that didn't stop IDW throwing them into their continuity, and of course putting them up against the Transformers. A continuity set after the Cybertronian Civil War, where Prismos has been destroyed because the whole race now seemed to live in a refugee camp under the surface of Cybertron, which saw Cup getting murdered by a character called Virulina in a death that felt pretty final. They wrote him a heartfelt memoriam and gave us some panels of his greatest moments. And I got a little choked up. Until I remember that they did bring him back for the 2019 IDW continuity. And the Darkling Lords declaring that they're going to take over the whole of Cybertron by using their magic to genocide all of the Cybertronians. Yeah, basically the Cybertronians are particularly vulnerable to the Visionaries' magic, so they need the Spectral Knights to come in and help them out. Waspinator gets transformed into this, and yeah, this whole thing kind of stank of trying to shine a light onto a long dead franchise and getting new eyes on it by pairing them with a huge brand like the Transformers. And I guess it worked, because I'm talking about it now. Well played, Hasbro. 
Next, let's look at Transformers vs. Terminator, which is a very interesting prospect. It starts in yet another alternate future, a future where the Decepticons have won the war against the Autobots and devastated Earth. Cosmos is dead, B is short a couple of limbs, and as we're introduced to a T-800 and taken back to Skynet, you start to realize that Skynet are the good guys in here and are the Resistance struggling to hold on against the Decepticons. As well as the T-800s and the Hunter Killers, Skynet have made these giant T-8000s, which are half Terminator, half Cybertronian. But even they don't really stand that much of a chance against Starscream, the Insecticons, and the Seekers, who destroy the Skynet base, but not before Skynet managed to send the organic shell T-800 back to 1984. Incidentally being the year that both the Terminator and the Transformers movies were released, as well as the original Ghostbusters and Footloose, which hasn't got a Transformers crossover yet. These future versions of Starscream and the Seekers apparently turn into hunter killers themselves, having adapted their alt modes into something that blends in a little better. I thought that was pretty neat. Anyway, the T-800 meets Sarah Connor, takes her to the Ark, where the volcano in Mount St. Helens has awoken the Decepticons. Once they arrive there, the T-800 tells Sarah Connor that actually he's not even remotely interested in protecting her, as his main objective is to kill the enemies of Skynet, and John Connor or his army doesn't even seem to exist. The Terminator arrives just as Megatron is about to kill the still dormant Optimus, but the T-800 engages them until Sarah Connor accidentally wakes up Optimus, and he chins Starscream and then clubs Soundwave with Ravage. The cons retreat, and the Terminator tells the story of the Decepticon takeover, and the plot goes from there. But suffice to say, I quite enjoyed this one. It was fun seeing the T-800 getting tooled up with these massive Cybertronian weapons, and the ending was pretty cool too, with the T-800 being launched into Megatron's chest like a projectile and being cooked by his spark as a result. Is he doing the thumbs up thing there? I can't tell. I want the thumbs up thing. At this stage, he's blown up the Ark so that they have no way of communicating with Cybertron or calling in reinforcements, forcing the remaining Cybertrons to call a truce and effectively ending the Cybertronian War. Temporarily, at least. And with them having spent this whole story trying to ensure that Skynet does come into being, when it finally does come online, it turns out that it's used the remains of Megatron to create its computerized defense network, which means that Megatron still lives on and Skynet is more dangerous than ever. Okay, let me just ask you real quick, if you would want Transformers to cross over with any other franchise, what would it be? Let me know in the comments. All right, on with the show. The Transformers and the Joes have crossed paths many times since the 80s. One time, the Joes mistaking Bumblebee's actions as hostile and blowing him to pieces. Bombshell using a Cerebro shell on this kid and putting him into a shock-induced coma until the mind control device was surgically removed from his brain. The kid was just playing with his dog. Shockwave came up with a plan to use a power plant as a device to extract the planet's natural energy, which naturally will destroy the planet in the process. He even makes a PowerPoint presentation about it. The Dreamwave continuity saw a super dark team upset in the Second World War. Some of the visuals are amazing in this one. Check out what Laserbeak looks like. Starscream turns into, what is this, a Hellcat? The Seekers are Japanese Zeros. Ironhide looks really cool as a Sherman tank. Megatron turns into like a Luger. Sometimes the visuals are a little too dark, you know what I mean? I quite like them. Oh, here we go. Don't you have some unspeakable horror to be inflicting on someone? <sighs> Ignore him, that happens sometimes. Anyway, it sees Shockwave blasting both Superion and a whole enemy fleet of ships with his enormous artillery cannon mode. Destro and Baroness double-crossing their double-cross buddy Starscream and killing him by shooting him with this little tiny gun. Uh, they reckon the shot hit him in a weak spot, but hmm. All this before Destro unleashes Bruticus on both the good guys and the bad guys before Optimus tells Snake Eyes to destroy the Matrix, a move that he knows will kill not just Bruticus, not just all of the Decepticons, but the Autobots too. Image Comics and Devil Jew's G.I. Joe vs. the Transformers saw Cobra turn several Transformers into remote-controlled death machines, including Optimus and Prowl. Starscream got this very cool alt mode, Soundwave helped them build these very cool mechs, and Thundercracker, whose alt mode is a warthog in this one, transforms with a Cobra operative still inside his cockpit, which crushes him to death, I think. What a way to go. Oh, and Wheeljack uses a human keyboard. And if you're wondering how, I mean, his finger is probably the size of a human by itself, right? Well, here's how. I don't know, I thought that was interesting. Snake Eye slashes Starscream's eye before shoving a grenade in there. Now I say it out loud, it sounds kind of violent. And the Autobots leave Earth, leaving their new friends with these very cool mech suits to defend in their absence. 
Then in the sequel crossover, two years after that, Cobra tried to seize Teletran 3, which destabilized, sending different Transformers to different eras of history. And that is a great concept because it gives us some crazy alt modes. For example, in the 70s era, Jazz turns into a pimp mobile owned by a pimp, no less. Bitch, I've been pimping ever since pimping been pimping, ho. Bitch, I wouldn't give a damn. What is wrong with- B gets this slightly uninspiring whatever it is, Hot Rod gets this, and Blitzwing turns into a private jet, which looks like it's bound to be used by the CIA. Like, they just turn a corner and all these guys in white shirts are standing in front of this jet, and they're like, what? And they're like, what? Then it jumps to the 1920s in Chicago, where Optimus's truck mode suddenly looks like this. The Stunticons look like this. But unfortunately, you don't get to see what Menasaur would have looked like. Then in the next one, called The Art of War, Cobra created Serpentor, or Serpent OR, who is made up of the combined DNA of past military geniuses. He's a techno-organic supervillain who really wants the Matrix of Leadership and at one point gets it to become Serpentor Prime. And then in Black Horizon, a group called Cobra La tried to bring Unicron to Earth. Then in 2014, IDW did this whole line of comics with this retro style art style. So, these Joes had a fight on top of Megatron's head and fought alongside the Autobots when Megatron wanted to have Cybertron transform into its robot mode Primus and devour the sun. And at one point, they discover that the Earth itself is a titan called Atlas, the lost sibling of Primus, who also wears Italy as a literal boot. Oh, and the Arctic as a mask. There was also one comic which was supposed to be a comic book adaptation of a fictitious movie made based on the series. Ah, oh, my head hurts. <laughs> yeah, listen, if there's enough interest, I'll do a whole vid on the G.I. Joe Transformers comics through the ages. Because I am literally just scratching the surface here. Kind of, but not really related, is... <laughs> Mask also lives in the same universe as Transformers. In the IDW continuity, Project Spectrum was an effort to develop anti-Transformer weaponry. I'd love to do a Mask retrospective at some point, but I don't know when that's going to happen. I also heard somewhere that Zoids was part of the same universe, although I'm not sure if that's true or not. I'd love that to be true. Another one that I personally was really up for was Transformers versus Star Trek. Not because it's a great combination necessarily, but more because Star Trek is just one of those franchises that has a very fond place in my heart. This five issue miniseries featured the Gen 1 style characters coming together with the track characters as portrayed in the 70s Star Trek animated series, which included MRS. Clarify, please. Who was a Cation? Apparently, Uhura's replacement in the animated series in the final two years of the Enterprise's legendary five year mission. She'd stand in as a science officer on away missions and even had a very brief romance with Monty Scott. <laughs> You're funny. Whilst the crew was under the influence of a love potion made by a flamboyant pirate with a comb over. The extent of this romance we will never know. To me it just seemed like a kind of a flirtation. But you know, look at this guy. You know, he, he looks mischievous. Look at him. Yeah, he's doing it. Story starts with Enterprise picking up a distress signal beep, 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 on a mining colony called Cygnus 7. You got a big drill. Jesus, Steve, don't say it like that. I told you not to say it like that. It sounds weird when you say it like that. On the border with Klingon space. Where else? They find that bizarrely it's being attacked by 20th century vehicles, which of course turn out to be Decepticons. B explains how the outbreak of World War III on Earth prompted the Autobots to leave for good aboard Fortress Maximus, unaware that the cons were pursuing them in Trypticon. So you know what's next. Battle in space. They crash. They go into stasis until they're woken up by the miners. In this one, we've got Spock mind melding with Optimus, the, the furry attacking Bee as if she thinks she can actually damage him, and the first human Cybertronian interracial kiss. No, I'm just joking, I made that one up. The real Enterprise gets put out of action by a warbird, and Ratchet comes up with a plan to bring Fort Max back online, and when he does, guess what alt mode he gets? Yes! Then, for some reason, Kirk has to control the big guy, who's referred to as Fortress Tiberius, by the way. Nice touch, like it. With a headset to fight Trypticon, who of course has taken the form of a Klingon warbird. And the whole thing ends with Starscream breaking ranks to try and conquer Kronos, with the crew of the Enterprise, the Klingons, and the Autobots all coming together to protect the Klingon homeworld. And the Enterprise crew being given Cybertronian sized battlesuits that they made with their replicators to even the playing field a little. I love how they've individualized them. This one's got a tail. The Decepticons are defeated when it turns out the Klingons are impervious to sound wave sonic paralysis frequency that, that incapacitated all of the other good guys. And the Klingons figured out how to calibrate their weapons to best 
to best damage Cybertronians. And then they have a whole fleet of warbirds who turn up and blast them to pieces. The Autobots go on their way in Fortress Tiberius, telling the Starfleet crew that they would never be too far away if they ever needed help. And what can I say? Like, I enjoyed this one. If they ever did it again, though, I would want to see the Next Generation crew. Damn, why are they all so hench? Geordi looks like he's going to kill someone. NCC 1701D or E, I'm alright with that too. And of course, the f***ing Borg. Can you imagine what would happen if Cybertronians got assimilated? You don't have to, because I'm going to tell you, it'd be carnage. In Transformers vs the New Avengers, Megatron steals an aggression device from Doctor Doom. Megatron uses it to make all the superheroes all cranky and fighty. Cap orders a team of him, Wolverine, Luke Cage, Miss Marvel and Falcon to attack the Autobots, resulting in some pretty odd moments when Miss Marvel starts attacking Ratchet. In vehicle mode, so she's literally angrily punching and attacking an ambulance, and he defeats her by deploying his airbags in her face. Like, superpowers be damned, I've got safety systems. Mirage just like drives over Wolverine right here. Not sure why that made me chuckle, but it did. <laughs> and barring superficial little bits of damage here and there, these super powerful superheroes didn't really do anything to the boss. Anyway, Megatron's plan somehow involves this dome, which is somehow going to devastate the planet. I don't know, generic doomsday device alert. <laughs> But he also initiates mirror response mode, which is a procedure that, that gives his troops an energy enhancement based on the data taken from a captive Spider-Man. And just as I was thinking, oh, we're going to get web-slinging Decepticons. No, unfortunately not. They just kind of get a little bit powered up. Iron Man does make a Transformers-sized Iron Man suit, though, although his arc reactor does struggle with the amount of power that this thing requires. And of course, Doctor Doom becomes an honorary Decepticon until he switches size back again and frees Spider-Man before Optimus and the other Autobots give some of their energy to power Tony Stark's suit. Love how it has just a basic power outlet in the back of his leg, but accidentally overload it, so everyone takes a little breather and has a little cup of tea. Anyway, using the same tech the cons used to absorb Spider-Man's power, Wolverine gives the Autobots some of his power, and they use that to destroy both the angry device and the generic Doomsday Dome. Did it give them healing powers? Did it give them claws? Hairy shoulders, even? No. Iron Man vs Megatron was a pretty interesting prospect, though. But it's a fight that's pretty easily won by Megatron, who blasts the Iron Suit's head off. But he's then beaten when Spider-Man webs him up with his webs, just standard webs as far as I can tell. Webs? And then Luke Cage trips him over, and yeah, it's a complete anticlimax. And yeah, like I said, this one is really a missed opportunity. They could have gone really wild with this one. Logan didn't go berserker and get up to his neck in Robo Guts, and I don't know who drew him like this. There was no Sentinels from X-Men, which I reckon would have been the perfect fit for this. Miss Marvel, well, she wasn't in it much. Let's stick to the positive. And if they're seriously going to give the bots some superhero power, then they could have done something way more interesting than what they did do. Apparently, the Justice League were going to have a Transformers crossover too, but it got cancelled because of one of Justice League's many reboots. Anyway, moving along, in a tech story in 2019, the Transformers crossed paths with Japanese super mecha Mazinger Z. <laughs> when four mysterious entities opened a portal between universes. Why? F*** you is why. So Mazinger Z was originally a manga from the 1970s. It's about this professor who built this robot to fight Dr. Hell, who was an archaeologist who discovered this ancient empire who used these mechanical titans. And Dr. Hell figures out how to control them, goes insane, tries to take over the world. You know, standard supervillain. Anyway, from what I understand, the bad guys lie to the Autobots, telling them that Mazinger Z is the evil one, and yeah, you know, it's a pretty standard story. Mazinger's towering size doesn't seem to affect his speed, and he uses both to easily overcome the bots. Once they realize they're on the same side, Grimlock's fire breath is able to damage Dr. Hell's mechanical beasts, before Mazinger has a more even matchup with Devastator, and he uses his signature rocket arms to force Devastator to disassemble. The most interesting thing to me is that one of the four mysterious figures who opened the portal to begin with turns out to be Go Nagai, the creator of Mazinger Z and a guy who's often credited with creating the super robot genre altogether. And having him in here is like how Stan Lee is rumored to be the one above all in the Marvel Universe. So back to the future. Doesn't seem like an obvious choice for a crossover, does it? There's a little bit of time travel in Transformers here and there, but other than that, but weirdly enough, I thought this one really worked. It takes place after the events of the first Back to the Future movie. The Decepticons suddenly want the DeLorean so they can use time travel to give them the advantage in their war. So after what initially seems like a failed attempt to steal the DeLorean, where B fights off Rumble, Doc heads to the future in the DeLorean and Marty goes home to sleep. 
waking up in a nightmare alternate present with the Decepticons have enslaved humanity and used them to, to mine Energon. Marty escapes on a skateboard before a DeLorean saves him from Starscream. Obviously you think it's going to be Doc come to the rescue, but the DeLorean promptly transforms and becomes an Autobot called Gigawatt. And look at him, how can you not love this guy? Anyway, it turns out that Marty's skateboard is a Transformer too. this little rad looking dude called Skills, which I thought was a nice little touch. They travel to 2015 and meet Rodimus, who explains that Rumble stole the DeLorean and went back to 1984, where he woke up Megatron, who then slaughtered the dormant Autobots, giving them free reign to take over. Anyway, as par for the course, Biff Tannen allies himself with the Decepticons until he doesn't, and, and just when they thought the cons were beaten, the whole Hill Valley courthouse turns into a massive Decepticon called Watchtower. Again, love the design of this guy. Bumblebee is killed in the ensuing battle, and Rodimus is crushed too, and Gigawatt, the only one who can actually fix this situation, dives in front of some laser fire to protect the humans, leaving him badly damaged. With a bit of help though, he manages to get to the magic 88 miles per hour, and although they're forced to leave Doc Brown and Skills behind, he manages to get back to 1984 and wake up Optimus and the Autobots, and long story short, they fix the whole timeline. I really enjoyed this one. Starscream is the one who gets covered in manure, Gigawatt's license plate spins around after he blasts back in time, and then at the end when they think all is hunky-dory again, you see that Marty's truck has a Decepticon insignia on it. And yeah, like I said, all these are just a few small connections that make a crossover work. Next, we gotta talk about the X-Files crossover. And yeah, this is one that surprised me too. So my memory of X-Files is pretty fuzzy, but I vaguely remember these three characters in it called the Lone Gunmen, and I think they would feed Mulder intel and loads of nutty conspiracy theories. Apparently they had their own series in 2001. Doesn't sound like it was anything special, apart from the fact that in the pilot, rogue members of the US government hijack an airliner departing from Boston, planning to crash it into the World Trade Center. What the fuck? Just bearing in mind that this aired six months prior to the September the 11th attacks? What the fuck? That's crazy. Anyway, back to the comic. This plotline basically sees the gunmen looking into all these urban legends whilst trying to avert the outbreak of this super virus. That leads them to meet the Turtles, the Ghostbusters, and then the Transformers as they realize that the virus has been blended with Cybertronian robotic DNA, which I think has been taken from Ratchet, who then they have to go and break out from some facility somewhere. So not only is this a slightly unfitting matchup, it's kind of dull. Transformers and Evangelion even crossed over at one point, but sadly only in a text story that only had four panels to illustrate them. It basically dealt with the re-emergence of the angels and Transformers came to fight them. The ghost of Starscream appears and jumps into the body of Sashiel, Sachiel, making Angel Scream. Optimus scans Ever One and turns green and purple and gets big. <laughs> and they have a battle in which OP wins by charging red energy from his core into his energy axe and buries it into the angel, hitting its core and expelling Starscream's ghost. Then we got Rom, who's a human robot hybrid, one of a thousand chosen to be a space knight and fight the dreaded dire wraiths. You know, dire wraiths hailing from a dark nebula, wielders of powerful dark magic, can parasitically transform their victims into more of their kind. Also, they secretly invaded Earth a little while back, but shh. The Rom toy was launched in 1979. This is Rom, the space knight. Which was quickly followed by a Marvel comic that ran for several years before later being absorbed by the Hasbro juggernaut and licensed to IDW for their continuity. They made him and his race neighbors of the Cybertronians. And because the Cybertronian war had spilled out across the galaxy, inflicting devastation everywhere, they weren't exactly the best of friends. And the Galactic Council absolutely hate them, being properly robophobic. The Rom vs. Transformers Shining Armor crossover highlighted how the Space Knights of the Soulstar Order view the Cybertronians as mindless killing machines as Rom found a young Transformer called Stardrive, who tries to become a Space Knight despite all of the prejudice she faces. It saw Starscream teaming up with the Dire Race to get her unique Energon synthesizer, and a team of Magnus, B, and Skyblast having to make an uneasy alliance with the Space Knights for the common good. Skyblast is mutated into this, as is Ultra Magnus who turns into this. And can we just take a second to appreciate the magnificence of these panels? Aren't they incredible? And he ends up sacrificing his life to take out Vectal, which unfortunately doesn't stop Starscream from wiping out the planet and countless Z-Taxians. Personally, I thought this crossover was excellent. X. Excellent. This one didn't feel like just a novelty to me. It was short-lived for sure, but it felt like the two franchises were weaved together in a pretty well thought out way. I'll get into greater detail about ROM when I look at powerful entities that aren't Autobots or Decepticons. I mean, let's just call it the Unicron bit. Let's face it, it's the Unicron bit, let's face it. Run! 
Right, what's next? In 2011, IDW did another of these multi-franchise crossovers called Infestation, which roped in the Transformers, Star Trek, Ghostbusters, and G.I. Joe, and it saw a bunch of scientists opening a portal to Dimension Z. And if you're wondering who lives in Dimension Z, well, it's not a load of friendly people who don't want to eat your brains. Nuh-uh. It's zombies. Zombies under the control of the Undermind Intelligence. A vampire- Whoa! <laughs> a vampire agent called Brit sends copies of herself through different portals with a bunch of zombies that are then picked up by Galvatron's ship. And several of his sweeps are infected, causing the ship to crash in Vegas. Vegas! <laughs> Numb. Where the Decepticons and Autobots come together to fight the zombies before Cup manages to send them to the dead universe. But unfortunately, he gets trapped in there with them. Has this man not been through enough? Like here, he has to go through the PTSD of remembering the last time he was caught in a zombie invasion, and then he gets worn like a glove for like 12 pages. The question of what a zombie transformer would look like isn't exactly a new one. We've had the Necro Titan, we've had various hybrids over the years, but this is the first time that an old school movie villain type zombie comes up against a transformer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, in 2012, IDW were at it again. And guess what they called it? Infestation 2 is what they called it. That's right. And they opened their property cupboard and they dug everything out. The Joes, the Turtles, 30 Days of Night, everything except for Godzilla. And they wove the whole thing into this story that saw HP Lovecraft's Elder Gods loosed from their prison. And they just ran amok throughout the multiverse. It fit in after Hearts of Steel, which is the one that introduced that really cool steampunk look. And it sees the Transformers team up with Nikola Tesla, inventor of electric cars and autonomous driving. It sees an eldritch worm ending up in Texas, the Deep Ones coming ashore on the eastern seaboard, human followers subduing others to become food for the Traveler. And it's just got a great atmosphere. Anyway, more specifically to the Transformers, Ironhide realizes that Bone Crusher has been assimilated. Oh, fuck. Who overwhelms Ironhide and drags him to the depths. Oh, fuck. Ironhide, in this new abominable form, <laughs> attacks the other Autobots, while Optimus sets his sights on the Elder God, slicing its tentacles off with his saws, eventually managing to send it back where it came from. It was a little easy, considering, you know, Cthulhu. Hmm. But I still enjoyed it. Hmm. And then, there's My Little Pony. My if there's two franchises that really did not seem to belong anywhere near each other, it's these two. But considering that they are two of Hasbro's biggest franchises, I guess it was bound to happen. The Bayformers movies had a couple of small nods to this here and there, and apparently in Robots in Disguise, Kickback was looking at some items he'd collected, one of them being a pony toy. But then we have Friendship in Disguise, where the queen of the changelings, called Queen Chrysalis, tries to find more beings like her to help her conquer the pony land of Equestria. So she casts this spell which accidentally fires up a space bridge and pulls the Autobots and the cons through to Equestria. Rainbow Dash has a race with Wimblade to see who's the fastest before they decide that competition is stupid and they share the trophy. The Insecticons get loose in Applejack's farm. <laughs> we are a long way from Overlord ripping people's heads off, aren't we? As I mentioned in my last vid, Shockwave was in this. Basically, Pinkie Pie was doing a cooking show, introducing everyone to her favorite Cybertronian dish, which was this casserole made from iron filings, which of course wasn't that popular, when Shockwave appeared, eager to find out how many ponies it would take to fuel a single Cybertronian, before he's made to look a right tit as Pinkie Pie and her Autobot friend Gage rip off Shockwave's hands then repeatedly hit him over the head with frying pans before kicking his cyclops ass back through the space bridge. And why is his head round now? Is it, is it because he was hit with frying pans? <laughs> they flattened his head. Fluttershy tries to rub some boo-boo cream into Ravage's nose. Soundwave is like, decrease absurdity. Fluttershy was like, you're mean. And then set a bunch of evil bunnies on Soundwave until Soundwave went friendship superior. And she was like, squeeze. Or something. Anyway, Grimlock and Spike fix the space bridge, and Twilight Sparkle combines her magic with the power of the Matrix of Leadership to force the Decepticons back through the space bridge, leaving Shockwave explaining his plan to bring the magic of Equestria to Cybertron. <laughs> which he follows up in the next storyline, Magic of Cybertron, which sees Megatron be mind-controlled by this guy, 
This is King Sombra, who's trying to raise a Transformer army, something which forces Optimus and Shockwave to work together. <laughs> Killmaster gets wrapped up with Pony String. The Seekers team up with the Wonderbolts, which I think are like the flying ponies. And Soundwave is used as a giant DJ setup to get them all out of a collapsed building. Of course, learning the power of friendship and working together. Hey, oh, oh, friend. Oh, friend. Superion falls under the control of King Sombra and wipes the floor with the Dinobots. For Knockout makes an appearance making an impassioned speech to break his partner breakdown free of the mind control. Remember that in the Till All Are One comics, he's a cosmetic surgeon who never wanted any part of the war and in a romantic relationship with Breakdown. Anyway, the ponies get their own exosuits, they have to fight Scorponok, and Megatron gets smothered with cuddles. Ah. All right, you guys, I gotta leave it there. Let me know in the comments if I've missed anything. If you like Transformers, you might like my gaming channel because I'm just playing through Devastation now. And I just managed to find a copy of War for Cybertron, which I have never played before. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch my videos and I will see you very soon for the next one. Cheerio, bye.